What? It's a pandemic. Can't find a hairdresser. <sighs> All right, it's video three. In this one, we're going to start applying our configurations to the EX4300 that we have. In the previous couple videos, I kind of set the stage for what we are going to be accomplishing throughout the series, which is essentially migrating a configuration from an iOS switch, Catalyst 3750, over to an EX4300 virtual chassis, uh, three-member virtual chassis or stack, if you will, and how we go about bringing that configuration for that iOS device over into a not really straight one-to-one -one configuration, but sort of building the intent uh, for the, our Juniper devices. That's what a reshoot looks like. I don't know, the audio got choppy. Anyway, what we're going to do in this video, and <laughs> my hair hasn't gotten better, obviously, uh, we're going to go through the initial configuration elements that are in the system part of the hierarchy. It's going to be host name, DNS, uh, just the bits and bobs, our passwords. And we're also going to take a quick look at the first step in my favorite way to handle interfaces on a switch, particularly one that's going to be in a virtual chassis like this one. So we're going to cut over to that, uh, that workspace and we'll get started. All right, so I've zeroized my switch and I have created a text file that is taking the configuration elements from the last video again, the intents, not the actual set commands. And I basically pulled out the subset that goes under the system part of the configuration and added just a few bits and pieces there on the left above me. So let's jump over to the switch. Uh, it's just rebooted from a zero eyes. The request system zero eyes command is what you use to basically blank a switch like it's coming out of the box. You can also load factory defaults from within the configuration, but if you really just want to nuke and pave and start over, the zero eyes is the way to go. I'm going to log in as root. There's not going to be any password as long as you're connected via console. That first login, before you do any commits, log in with root, no password. Now, when you log in as root, you're dumped into the BSD shell. Uh, here, actually, let me clear the screen. You'll see a prompt like this. You're going to have to type CLI to get to operational mode where we can actually start doing stuff. The root account is the only account that exhibits this behavior. If you create and log in as any account other than root, you'll always go here to operational mode. And ooh, that bit that you just saw, this is a, a ZTP element. It's attempting to go do an auto image upgrade. There's also some DHCP running in the background. This is part of the default config. We'll continuously see this message until we disable it. So one of our first tasks over here on the left, actually the first task is to delete that and then set a host name set a root password. In fact, I'm going to do the root password first because after we set it, we're going to want to do a commit so we stop seeing these messages here. Let's go ahead and get into the configuration. You can type configure or edit. See that scroll can get real annoying real quick. So I'm just gonna follow exactly what it's telling me to do right here. I'll do a delete chassis auto image upgrade. And then I'm also going to set my root authentication. Since we're working almost exclusively in the system part of the configuration hierarchy, I'm just going to go into that part of the hierarchy by doing edit system, and I'll run my set commands from here. Like everything else in Junos, you can, I can run these set commands and just do set system and then the commands, but if I go into the system part of the hierarchy, I don't have to worry about that system part of that set command string. Uh, set root. Uh, it's, okay, let's make sure we get this clean so you can see it. Set root authentication, plain text password. I'll hit enter and I'll put in the password we're using lab123, lab123, and I'll just do a quick commit here. You cannot do a commit until that root password is set, so that is a requirement. And again, I wanted to do it right away so I don't have to see this annoying scroll going back and forth as we continue our work. You can also paste in an encrypted password. You can see if I do a show command here that it has encrypted that password. This would be what you would have in a template that would you know, be applied to other devices if you were creating a template. Plain text just allows you to type in a password into this console, hit enter, it encrypts it. A couple different ways to do that. All right, so we're through the first two steps here. I'll go ahead and bold that. Let us know it's done. Now let's set our host name. It's lab1. We're going to create a user. This is done under set login user lab. We're going to give it a class. A class is what defines the access to local resources that this user will have. 
Now, if I hit question mark, you can see that there are a few classes here already. You can also create your own class. Uh, we support a, a very robust uh, role-based access control configuration or RBAC configuration. So you can get very granular with the permissions assigned to specific classes and by virtue of that, specific users. And this applies not just to locally created users, those classes can also be applied to TACAX users, RADIUS users, and any AAA users that might be accessing the system as well. Or even service accounts that you know, are non-interactive, somebody's coming in and you know, there's an automated process that logs in. So for the sake of what we're doing, this is just gonna be a super user. And then we'll do plain text password as well, authentication, plain text password, and lab123, lab123. You can also, there, instead of saying uh, plain text password, that would be also where you would put in a uh, you know, key if you're using uh, PKI for SSH. So you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have a plain text password, or you can have both, and then you can set up an authentication order that would you know, try to use one and then use the other. Same with uh, AAA. All right, let's give ourselves a domain name. Not required. I know if you're on iOS, you need to set a domain name before you can generate an SSH key. Not the case with Junos. I'm just doing this because it's part of my workflow. And we'll set a name server, which will not work until we obviously have some of our interfaces configured and some routing set up. That's also important here uh, for this next step. So right now we're at the NTP part. Now this is configured under system, but since I'm using this pool server, the way this works is that when I do the set command with that FQDN, it will immediately try to resolve it and then it'll add that IP address to the config. Now it's not gonna be able to do that, re that resolution right now. So if I do set NTP pool.ntp.org and hit enter, it's gonna give me an error. Well, oh. <laughs> it'll particularly give me an error if I forget to put the word server in, but it'll say it can't resolve it and it can't. So I'm gonna have to come back to that later. Now let's enable SSH, it's under both here, show services, set services, SSH. You can define a version, I'm not bothering. Um, what I do want to do though, is allow root access. And that's just, for me, makes my life a bit easier. You might have security policies that say root never gets to log in unless it's connected via console, or you might want to have a very complex password for root that you know, allows you to come in if all else fails. Uh, I do it because it's just easier in a lab for me to just use the root account. So set services SSH, uh, root login by default is not enabled, so you have to explicitly allow it. If we look at our configuration now, we'll see most of those elements already in here. I'm also going to remove this phone home. I don't need it, this is optional, but this is also for cloud-based ZTP. I'm not doing cloud-based CTP, so I don't need the phone home. Now, you can't tab this out. You do need to type it out. There's an explanation for that I'm not gonna get into, but it's not broken. It's supposed to be that way. And we don't have web management enabled here, but I do have a note about verifying that it's not there. Uh, I never use it, so I'm trying to remember exactly where you go for it. Is it under web uh, services probably? Yeah, there it is, web management. So if it was configured, it would be under services and web management. It's not enabled by default. I never use it. So uh, if it is there, turn it off. Uh, you're probably not gonna be using it. If you are, that's where it goes. Do not enable HTTP, you only do HTTPS. Again, no telnet either, you naughty people. All right, so we've done all of this. Oh, and now we need to do our banner message of the day. I'll go ahead and copy that right out of here. Oh, and this is fun. Geez, this is gonna take as much time as the rest of the video. Now, looking at the message of the day, I have to confess to having somewhat forgot the syntax. Uh, I put it over here now yeah, on the side. The, this bit here is gonna create a problem for the message of the day we already have because the message of the day we already have includes a couple instances where there's multiple backslashes next to each other, which in this case is going to turn into a backslash. Guess how I found out? <laughs> By doing this and re-recording it. So what I've done is I've generated another message of the day, and I put it over here, and following these instructions, all we basically need to do is just add that slash n for new lines. 
The easiest way to do this is to start at the end of your ASCII art or whatever you're trying to put in because you're going to end up with one long string. Uh, start at the very end, go up to the previous line, use your arrow key to go forward to jump you to the front of that line, hit backspace, and then do your slash n and just repeat. You only have to do it twice here, so that's nice. And we'll copy this, we'll go back to our configuration. The message of the day is set under login, so we do set login message. Make sure you put it in parentheses and then we paste it in and enter. Now it's probably going to look like a fright in here, but that should look okay once we do our commit. So we finished all of our system configuration at this point. I'm just going to do a quick commit and quit and we'll check that message of the day. And assuming it looks okay, we're then going to do my interface cleanup and we'll end the video and move to the next one, which will be interfaces. And you'll see why I'm doing this interface cleanup in this video first. So exit, exit. Hey, that looks terrific. Great. Root, use our new root password to log in. Dumps you back into the CLI. Pardon me, the shell. Go up to operational mode, config, and this it always puts you in the middle for some reason. And let's do our interface cleanup. Huh. So if I do show interfaces right now, I see every interface. Look at that. Boo hiss, no fun. Let's do this, delete interface, great, done. Now, I can't just do that. I'm sure it's referenced by at least spanning tree. Yeah, that interface all, no, it might let me do it since it's not specific. Let's see. If the, on some versions, older versions of software, the spanning tree configuration actually lists out all the interfaces. You have an interface that's explicitly configured for a protocol, then it will complain if it's been deleted from the uh, interface configuration. But if it's all and it's not there, then it doesn't care. So if I show interfaces, they ain't there. And I'm going to show you in the next video why that's awesome. That's it for now. Thanks for the time. And hopefully I'll have the next ones done up here pretty soon.